Um, okay, so I'm Sarah Fanta, I'm the director of the Greenberg Sociology Research Group. And um, this group was founded in 2013 um, to inaugurate a research program. Um, we now have um, an MPhil program in sociology reproduction, which will be launching in 2016. So if you know anyone who'd like to study in that area um, for an MPhil, they should get in touch with us. We also have a PhD program. And I'm very pleased to confirm that today, just today, just this morning actually, um, a lectureship in the sociology of reproduction has been advertised. So please um, pass that on to anyone who might be interested. Um, and before we go much further, I want to extend several thanks for the opportunity to be here at what is, I think it would be fair to say, my dream lecture um, <laughs> by William <laughs> Martin, um, the Agnes Ram 2.0. Um, you know, I did not know when I was a graduate student and I read Emily Martin's book, you know, that I would be standing here nearly, well, over a quarter of a century later. Um, introducing this amazing um, lecture in the context of a equally amazing conversation about reproductive studies here at Cambridge, because the Reproductive Sociology Group um, is part of a wider conversation here at Cambridge, um, History and Philosophy of Science, um, Generation to Reproduction Project, headed up by um, Nick Hopwood, Center for Family Research, um, led by Susan Blombach, Cambridge Sociolegal Group and many other groups here at Cambridge, including, of course, the sciences, are um, central to a conversation about reproduction that is becoming um, increasingly interdisciplinary and increasingly large. Um, it's important that that's the case because one of the things I felt when I read Emily Martin's first book, The Woman and the Body, A Cultural Analysis of Reproduction in 1987, is that the field of reproductive studies is what you might call very underdefined, in part because reproduction itself is so difficult to study, which is in part because it tends to be understood in a very um, biologistic frame, and to try and incorporate a more sociological or anthropological account of reproduction has been a challenge that Emily Martin, our speaker tonight, has been instrumental in meeting. Um, that book, The Woman in the Body, A Cultural Analysis of Reproduction, was not only field-defining, we could really say it was field-establishing. Um, it used a very innovative methodology to gather empirical accounts of reproduction and it put those into a very broad and very influential analysis that um, looked at the kind of um, links between reproduction and the productive economy. Um, Equally important has been Emily Martin's um, essay on which this lecture is based, her 1991 essay, The Egg in the Spring. I can't tell you how many emails I have from people who are really sorry they couldn't come <laughs> tonight who have taught this very witty and engaging essay to a range of audiences. Um, it's a wonderful pedagogical piece, um, as well as a beautifully written essay on one of the most important questions for the study of gender is the study of reproduction, which is how we understand the biological framing of reproduction. Um, and in this essay, um, I think Emily really shows us one of the most endearing and enduring parts of her work, um, which is her sense of humor. So when we were sitting around at dinner about a year ago, when Emily was here working on her new research project, and she said that she had been reworking this essay, which is now um, nearly 25 years old, I couldn't resist but ask her if she would be willing to come and present it to us tonight. And I'm absolutely delighted that she's here to do that. Um, before I turn it over to Emily and ask you to join me in welcoming her, I do want to say some thanks. I want to thank everyone in my research group who has made this possible. A lot of work has gone into setting this up, um, and I'm very, very grateful, um, in particular to Zane and Gertin, who has been the key person responsible, and Chantal Noack, who's our new Microsoft administrator, um, and the whole team who made this possible. 
I, I also want to thank um, Janelle Lenora, who organized the conference China Reprotech, with which this um, lecture coincides. This is a typical Reprosoft event, which is a very open ended, interdisciplinary event with a number of visiting Chinese scholars. I'm very grateful to all of the scholars who are participating in this event and um, for being here tonight. And, and finally, I want to acknowledge the funders. Um, we're particularly indebted to the Wellcome Trust. We also have funding from the British Academy, the ESRC, and Reprosoft um, benefits from funding from a number of other funding sources as well. Um, my task would not be complete without fulfilling Chantal's instructions for me before I came up here to the lecture, which is to tell you that the fire exits are there, <laughs> the toilets are there, <coughs> and staff are training CPR. Okay. Now, um, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Ellen Martin. Certainly, first go to Tara Franklin for, for having the brilliant idea of the Evans version 2.0, which seemed to just open the door to uh, a kind of free, free, I warn you, kind of free floating um, exploration of what has been happening with this topic. But also, I want to thank Janelle Lamoureux for uh, all of the arranging that she did on my behalf to get me here uh, in time and the whole reproductive sociology research group. I also uh, want to nod uh, to my biologist informant, Richard Cohen, who is my husband also, and actually is the co-author of this piece, who Sarah kindly invited and would be here. He's almost dying that he's not here, but he had a family wedding to attend, so he's here in spirit. And the last thing I want to say is that this, uh, this is uh, my first um, effort to do this, to look back at the 25 year ago article and to try to figure out what might have been happening since then. And it's not a, at all a finished product, it's a kind of breeze, a, a constant, you know, quick trip in and out, which might become a paper or someone else might want to write this paper. Um, but it's been a lot of fun looking into what's been going on, but it, but it is very much um, a first at first sort of glance. So to uh, remind you, or if you haven't ever read the original article, I was an anthropologist in the late, late um, 1980s, intrigued by the possibility that culture might shape how biological science, scientists describe what they discover about the natural world. And I uh, thought, if this were so, then we would be learning about more than the natural world in places like high school biology class which is kind of an innocent place to be learning about culture. We would be learning about cultural beliefs and practices as if they were part of nature. So this opportunity of doing this lecture a second time gave me a chance to see what's been going on in the last 30 years. I'm going to tell you my tentative conclusion before I present the argument, which is that a few things have changed that dislodge the old heterosexual romance of the idea of sperm. But what is replacing that romance, or adjoining it, I'm not sure which, may be a deeper, even more fraught cultural narrative, the narrative of parent and child, or father, mother, and child. So there's, there's a ways to go before, uh, before I can make the case for that. And first I want to refresh our memory of what was happening in the 1990s. I found that the picture of egg and sperm drawn in popular as well as scientific accounts of reproductive biology relied on stereotypes central to cultural definitions in the US and Europe of male and female. The implication of the stereotypes was not only that female biological processes are less worthy than male, but that women, I would assume that is a justified <laughs> extension of the um, uh, fact that their biological processes are less worthy, is that women are less worthy than men. For example, in a classical medical text, Medical Physiology, edited, edited by the very well-respected Vernon Mountcastle, the male-female productive-unproductive comparison was explicit. He says, whereas the female 
produces only a single gamete each month, the seminiferous tubules produce hundreds of millions of sperm each day. This is a slide of the seminiferous tubules, which are frequently illustrated in the biology text. The female author of another text marveled at the length of the microscopic seminiferous tubules, which, if uncoiled and placed end to end, she says, quote, would span almost one third of a mile, exclamation point. She wrote, quote, in an adult male, these structures produce millions of sperm each day. And later she asked, how is this feat accomplished? None of these texts express such intense enthusiasm for any female processes. <clears throat> On the contrary, textbook uh, descriptions stress that all of the ovarian follicles containing ova were already present at birth. So far from being produced as sperm are, they merely sit on the shelf, slowly degenerating and aging like overstocked inventory. At birth, normal human ovaries contain an estimated one million follicles each, and the text would go on, no new ones appear after birth. Thus, in marked contrast to the male, the newborn female already has all the germ cells she will ever have. You can kind of hear the sadness of this. <laughs> Only a few, perhaps 400, are destined to reach full maturity during her active reproductive life. All the others degenerate at some point in their development, so that few, if any, remain by the time she reaches menopause at approximately 50 years of age. The description, you will note, I'm sure, um, sets up a marked contrast between male and female. The male who continuously produces fresh germ cells, and the female who has stockpiled her germ cells by birth, and all, the, all through her life faces the reality <coughs> of their degeneration. So how is it that positive images are denied to the bodies of women? And uh, I, in the original article, I looked closely at language, both at technical scientific language and how uh, language is used in popular culture to provide many clues. Take the egg and the sperm, for example. It struck me as remarkable how femininely the egg behaves and how masculinely the sperm. You, you all know that sperm are not all male, right? Okay. <laughs> just thought I would point that out. <laughs> the egg was seen in this popular and scientific literature as large and passive. It basically does nothing. It doesn't journey. It is passively transported. It is swept. Or even in a popular account, it drifts along the Philippine tube. In utter contrast, sperm are small, streamlined, and invariably active. They go on a journey, a long journey. <laughs> they deliver their genes to the egg. They quote, oh, these are phrases from textbooks or scientific articles. They activate the developmental program of the egg, and they have a velocity that is often remarked upon. Their tails are strong and efficiently powered. Together with the forces of ejaculation, they can, quote, <coughs> compel the semen into the deepest recesses of the vagina. For this, they need energy, fuel, so that when they, quote, with flashlight motion and strong lurches, they can burrow through the egg coat and penetrate it. And illustrations of this penetration are, well, they abound in, in almost all the material. Sometimes the penetration is seen explicitly as violent, as in this illustration from a popular book, that saw the sperm as a weapon with a warhead, a chemical warhead just beneath the cat-like lie enzymes shown in red that help it penetrate the egg. But no less disturbing than this kind of overt depiction of violence is this cover of a very well-respected science newsletter, which showed the sperm working hard, but with tools designed to break down the egg's defenses. So, in contrast, the egg is imminently passive, which means it must depend on the sperm for rescue. Gerald Shatton and uh, Helen Shatton wrote an article in another, and this is a very well-respected scientific journal, in which they likened the egg troll to that of Sleeping Beauty, quote, a dormant bride awaiting her mate's kiss, which instills the spirit that brings her to life. 
You see that? You see the little sperm kissing the hair? <laughs> <laughs> sperm, by contrast, have a mission, which is to move through the female genital tract to the request of the ovum. The images pile up upon one another. In one photograph from the National Geographic, sperm were masters of subversion. Sperm cells, quote, seek to penetrate an ovum. Foreigners in a hostile body, they employ several strategies to survive their mission. Sometimes on the other side, and this is where humor happily comes in, a far side cartoon depicts the egg with her own resources. She is seen as a housewife besieged by clever sperm who try to get a foot inside the door. Sperm is postman says, package for you to sign for, ma'am. Sperm is phone repairman says, need to check your lines, ma'am. And sperm is insurance salesman says, mind if I step inside. So this is not an unusual um, <laughs> thing that sperm and get into cartoons quite frequently, even today. <coughs> the degree of metaphorical content in these descriptions, the extent to which differences between egg and sperm are emphasized, and the parallels between cultural stereotypes of male and female behavior and the character of egg and sperm, all seem to point to the conclusion that though the facts of biology might not always be constructed so boldly in cultural terms, in this case it seemed to me that they were, and that they were about a specifically heterosexual romance. And because so many people have used this article in teaching and have gotten and made a lot of headway with their students uh, getting on board with the idea of reproductive biology being something uh, that could be considered a site of cultural analysis. So, uh, some of my colleagues, this is not my work, some of my colleagues have made a teaching tool. <laughs> Red leader standing by. Gray leader standing by. Green leader standing by. Block air spoils in attack position. We're in position. I'm going to cut across the axis and try and draw their fire. I'm going in. You're all clear, kid. Now let's blow this thing and go home. This description of events was being rewritten rather dramatically in a biophysics lab at Johns Hopkins University and elsewhere, transforming the egg from the passive to the active party. So the original picture before this new research was that the zona, the inner vestments of the egg, formed an impenetrable barrier, and that barrier was overcome by sperm, who mechanically, with their forceful um, forward thrust, penetrated burrowed through, thrashing their tails and slowly working their way in so that they could um, fertilize the egg. Then later it was discovered that the sperm released digestive, digestive enzymes that added a chemical um, mechanism to the physical burrowing mechanism. So now at that point the sperm had both mechanical and chemical means of burrowing in. All the action was on the sperm side. In this new investigation, the researchers began to ask well, just how strong is the mechanical force of the sperm's tail? No one had ever asked that question before. And they used very, very simple technology that basically just a glass pipette and a little manometer. It was nothing new or fancy. And discovered to their great surprise that the forward thrust of the sperm is extremely weak, which very much contradicts this picture. 
and that they are the forceful penetrators. And then rather than thrusting forward, they actually sort of move like this, side to side. And um, the sideways motion of the spurt's tail makes the head move sideways with a force that is 10 times stronger than its forward movement. So even if the thrust, the movement of the sperm were strong enough to break the zona um, with the chemical helpers, uh, it would be moving sideways, not forward. And so this was a, a, a revolutionary um, new kind of picture. The reason for this, the biologists thought, was that the sperm do have a ways to go through the female tract to get to the egg, and if they were driving like little missiles into anything they came near, they would be driving into <coughs> the sides of the, of the vagina. And instead, what they're doing is sort of walking about, swimming in circles, prying themselves off of any surface. Um, you know, it's kind of like that. And so the image of them as forceful pen penetrators is uh, a little bit misleading. So the researchers concluded that the sperm and the egg stick together because of adhesive mo molecules on the surface of each, that it's a mutual process, that the egg does its part in trapping the sperm and adheres to it so tightly because it's thrashing, remember, like this, that its head is forced to lie flat against the surface of the zona, so not penetrating but flat, and that as it continues to move its tail, it sort of wiggles its way and is grasped more by the egg. It's a very different picture of a kind of uh, helpless and aimlessly moving sperm that gets caught by the um, egg. And they use the analogy of it's sort of like Br'er Rabbit falling into Tar Baby, and the more Br'er Rabbit wiggles, the, the more stuck he gets in Tar Baby. So, um, eventually these researchers reconceptualized the whole process to give the egg a more, act, a more active role. They described the zona, the surface of the egg, as an aggressive sperm catcher covered with adhesive mo molecules that can capture a sperm with a single bond and clasp it to the zona <coughs> surface. So, reading all this, looking at all this, talking to the biologists, I use this, myself, use this metaphor of waking up sleeping metaphors in science. Um, making ourselves aware of their implications for cultural ideas about reproduction. And I thought, I think naively at the time, that this would kind of rob these dominant metaphors of some of their power, that people would go, aha, I get it, I get it. This is you know, not necessarily the way to describe these processes. There are many other options. And I thought that it was important because I could see that if little molecules eggs and sperm are given the lives of little men and women, and they are given the role of making a new human being inside the um, fallopian tube of the woman, that this might have implications for how people thought about reproductive rights. I mean, it seems to me there was an immediate, <coughs> an immediate and important and powerful link between thinking of the life of what are really cells, gametes, thinking of them as person life. And so, um, I gave many lectures all over the place about this. But now, looking back, I think, looking what, at what has happened to reproductive rights in the United States, not speaking for any other country, I really wonder what, what, whether this strategy was so, <laughs> well, I mean, I just feel like, look where we stand, look what's happened, look how many attacks have been and how successful they have been. And um, it makes me wonder whether this was too, uh, too simple and too naive notion of what needed to be done to fix the situation. Okay, so that's the end of the summary of what was in the paper in 1991, and now I want to turn to what has changed in the last few years and some implications of those changes. So there are three notable changes. First, there has been a somewhat controversial but still accepted, um, has been published in major uh, scientific journals, finding that women's eggs are not in fact sitting on a shelf decaying all through her life, but that she has the capacity to produce a constant supply of fresh eggs throughout her life. Now, um, I know that this finding is somewhat controversial, but in fact, that language that I um, just read to you a minute ago about women's eggs being sale inventory moldering on a dusty shelf is gone from the textbooks. So whether this is, turns out to be 
definitively the case or not. That that whole um, chapter in this story has been removed from the textbooks. You no longer hear that women have these eggs that are going past their cell by date. Um, a new thing has been added, secondly, or the second um, change, is that um, the idea of chemotaxis attracting the sperm to the egg has been introduced and is, that is everywhere. It's um, here in a popular account, the sperm followed their noses. The chemotaxis is coming from the egg. So this is a way, this is a way it's basically saying that there's some kind of chemical signal coming from the egg that is attracting like a, a lure uh, or a special kind of perfume that's telling the sperm where to go. So it's giving the egg a, a, an active role. Um, and this theme of chemotaxis is everywhere in the textbooks. Depicted it differently with different drawings, but um, it would seem to be a way of saying, well, the egg does have an active role. Not, it's not just the sperm. The sperm is not the only gamete that has an active um, role to play. So my co-author, Richard Cohn, when I told him about this, he said, that's nonsense. He says, he said, it is more accurate to say the egg activates the sperm to swim in hy hyperactive circles around and around and around. So the chemotaxis may be activating the sperm, but not to attract it like a magnet to iron filing. So <laughs> they, they, they took a piece of this new finding, the chemotaxis, but left the old role of the uh, sperm as a kind of missile being drawn to the egg through the chemical signal. And some of the textbooks present this contradiction right on the same page. So here you have the claim of chemotaxis, the egg attracting the sperm, but then you have below the actual path that the sperm is following. <coughs> you got that? It's going all over the place, wobbling all over the place. So my uh, biological informant says um, sperm cannot detect gradients. They cannot read a signal, a chemical signal, with this, which is stronger in one place and then weaker and weaker and weaker, and no, somehow know that they should follow a gradient to find the target of the egg. It's impossible. That's nonsense. So I regard this as a way of, I don't know exactly how you would put it, but um, staying true to some new findings about the role of the egg, for sure, but hanging on to an, an older picture of the sperm as the one who's, who's actually the important active um, motive force. And this, I love this um, <laughs> illustration um, because they tell us that the egg is F, F. Can you see F? So that's it. That's an egg. And those are six sperm and their actual paths. And it's really hard to maintain the idea that there's chemotaxis and it's attracting the sperm to it, to the egg when you know that this is the picture of what they're doing. <laughs> and, and sperm number one, they call not interested. <laughs> <laughs> it just seems to be an uh, amazing amount of liberty taken with um, what can be read into these uh, the sorts of things, which is interesting. OK. so. First thing, the new thing is that uh, women make eggs all their life long. The second thing is that uh, the egg are given a role in attracting the sperm, how difficult that is. <coughs> and the third thing is, it is now widely acknowledged that sperm are propelled up the fallopian tubes by peristalsis of the female tract. This is everywhere. And it has been <coughs> widely, widely known for a very long time long before it appeared in the textbooks, but now it's there. The female tract has muscular contractions that move through the, the uh, uterus, the vagina, the uterus, and the fallopian tubes. Very powerful contractions that are moving the sperm where it needs to go. And my, biolog my biologist mm -hmm. co-author says, just tell them that if you put little specks of carbon in the female tract that are not alive, but are about the same size or weight or mass as a sperm. 
whose sperm and the unalive carbon particles will get to the fallopian tube at exactly the same time. Mm -hmm. So that tells you, it's not that the sperm is swimming, it's that they are all, all materials are being moved along at the same rate. Okay, so to um, kind of summarize a lot of what this is a lot of uh, a lot of different things I've looked at, but to summarize the current picture and to show you the partial uptake of new ideas, how this piece is taken, that piece is kept. It's certainly not a wholesale revision. Um, I'm going to show you an animation in a moment, which was is made by a medical illustration company called Nucleus. Um, which is a really snazzy outfit, and their, their animations are quite extraordinary. Um, they make them for medical education, for patient education, for introducing new devices, for um, um, teaching um, in classrooms. But I'm gonna show you uh, about five minutes of this um, animation. So you can see that there's partiality of the uptake of the new bio biological findings. And in the animation, as you will see, um, the perilous journey of the sperm against frightful odds is preserved. The animation still manages to picture them as directed as missiles or intrepid explorers on a journey to a goal. It does include the peristalsis of the female tract at some moments and forgets it at others. And just to fore foreshadow the animation, it says at one point that half of the sperm swim to one fallopian tube. You know, a woman has two fallopian tubes, and only one has an egg. You know, this is biology. So the animation says that half of the sperm uh, swim to one fallopian tube, and half swim to the other fallopian tube. Well, no, they they great proportion of them swim to the one that has the egg because the woman's body knows that's where the egg is and that's where the strong peristalsis is. So it's not just a random, you know, case of luck. But anyway, you'll see the, how the animation tells that part of the story. Um, I couldn't, my techn technique wasn't quite good enough to catch the beginning of this, so I'm gonna tell you it starts and then, and then I'll play it from a, uh, Couple seconds in, it begins. Fertilization is the epic story of a single sperm facing incredible odds to unite with an egg and form a new human being. And form a new human life. It is the story of all of us. During sexual intercourse, about 300 million sperm enter the vagina. Soon afterward, millions of them will either flow out of the vagina or die in its acidic environment. However, many survive because of the protective elements provided in the fluid surrounding them. Next, the sperm must pass through the cervix, an opening into the uterus. Usually, it remains tightly closed, but here the cervix is open for a few days while the woman ovulates. The sperm swim through the cervical mucus, which is thinned to a more watery consistency for easier passage. Once inside the cervix, the sperm continue swimming toward the uterus, though millions will die trying to make it through the mucus. Some sperm remain behind, caught in the folds of the cervix, but they may later continue the journey as a backup to the first group. Inside the uterus, muscular uterine contractions assist the sperm on their journey toward the egg. However, resident cells from the woman's immune system, mistaking the sperm for foreign invaders, destroy thousands more. Next, half the sperm head for the empty fallopian tube, while the other half swim toward the tube containing the unfertilized egg. Now, only a few thousand remain. Inside the fallopian tube, tiny cilia push the egg toward the uterus. To continue, the sperm must surge against this motion to reach the egg. Some sperm get trapped in the cilia and die. During this part of the journey, chemicals in the reproductive tract cause the membranes covering the heads of the sperm to change. As a result, the sperm become hyperactive 
swimming harder and faster toward their destination. At long last, the sperm reached the egg. Only a few dozen of the original 300 million sperm remain. The egg is covered with a layer of cells called the corona radiata. The sperm must push through this layer to reach the outer layer of the egg, the zona pellucida. When sperm reach the zona pellucida, they attach to specialized sperm receptors on the surface, which triggers their acrosomes to release digestive enzymes, enabling the sperm to burrow into the layer. Inside the zona pellucida is a narrow, fluid-filled space just outside the egg cell membrane. The first sperm to make contact will fertilize the egg. After a perilous journey and against incredible odds, a single sperm attaches to the egg cell membrane. Within a few minutes, their outer membranes fuse and the egg pulls the sperm inside. This event causes changes in the egg membrane that prevent other sperm from attaching to it. Next, the egg releases chemicals that push other sperm away from the egg and create an impenetrable fertilization membrane. As the reaction spreads outward, the zona pellucida hardens, trapping any sperm unlucky enough to be caught inside. Outside the egg, sperm are no longer able to attach to the zona pellucida. Meanwhile, inside the egg, the tightly packed male genetic material spreads out. A new membrane forms around the genetic material, creating the male pronucleus. Inside, the genetic material reforms into 23 chromosomes. The female genetic material, awakened by the fusion of the sperm with the egg, finishes dividing, resulting in the female pronucleus, which also contains 23 chromosomes. As the male and female pronuclei form, spiderweb-like threads, called microtubules, pull them toward each other. The two sets of chromosomes join together, completing the process of fertilization. At this moment, a unique genetic code arises, instantly determining gender, hair color, eye color, and hundreds of other characteristics. This new single cell, the zygote, is the beginning of a new human being. And now the cilia in the fallopian tube gently sweep the zygote toward the uterus, where he or she will implant in the rich uterine lining, growing and maturing for the next nine months until ready for birth. So can you see the way that um, part of the story is picked up and changed and part of the original story is left? Uh, I don't know if it comes across as coherent. I mean, it's, I've been watching this for so many weeks and months that uh, it looks very confusing to me, but I'm not sure how it, we can talk about that later, maybe. But um, this, I would say, represents the best of contemporary textbooks. This is an animation, but the best, the most um, highly sought after, most used by the most prestigious medical uh, or departments of biology for undergraduates um, have about this combination of the new material and the old material. Because you can see the sperm is still pretty much a conquering hero who takes great risks. Uh, the egg is given a little more um, role to play, a little more active play, uh, role to play than what was true in the old story. And now I want to, um, without hesitating, plunge into popular culture. Um, and this, uh, you all, can, if you're from the UK, you can uh, feel very, I don't know, a proprietary about this because it was produced by the BBC. It's extremely well known in the US. I can't tell you how many people have told me that I have to watch the great spring race. Uh, can I just see the show of hands? How many of you have seen, have seen this? Well, that's so much for the BBC's public health. <laughs> um, I was not able to actually obtain the whole, I've watched the whole thing, it's on YouTube. I think you should all rush home and watch the whole thing. This is just a preview, but it will give you the skeleton of the story. So this was made by Channel 4 for BBC News. 
with a lot of advertising and... Uh, Why did it succeed over billions of others? To find out, we're going to take you on the epic journey sperm undertake through the human body. And we're going to do it by scaling the whole thing up to human size. For the first time, we'll be able to appreciate just what an extraordinary journey sperm face as they try to reach the egg. It's one of nature's most spectacular stories, and it's the reason you're alive. The sperm will face death at every turn. There is no going back. No surrender. And only one winner. Back in our people-sized sperm world, what would this fitness test compare to? Well, what if your life depended on climbing a ladder? A ladder stretching over a mile into the sky. It's a long, gravity-defying climb that only a tiny fraction of sperm will be able to manage. For the 60,000 or so that do, it's out of the frying pan and into the fire. Now, they must endure stage two of their quest, the cervix. The objective here, to push four centimeters to the other side and reach the wide open space of the uterus. 
Sounds simple. Until we take a closer look at the terrain. The cervix is quite simply sperm hell. It's lined with tens of thousands of tiny branching tunnels, most roads to nowhere, and some just a single sperm head wide, where the vast majority, if not all, of Glenn's sperm will get crushed, trapped, and ultimately face a slow death. Nature does have a selection process in the cervix. It is selecting sperm that are well made. It would be a bit like me, dressed as a sperm, trying to climb a staircase that's a kilometre high. I'm defying gravity, I'm going against the flow, and when I get to the top I find that I've gone down the wrong staircase and I should have gone down another one. Our sperm must fight their way, crushed amongst thousands of others, up through a twisted, nightmarish urban environment. Only 1% of sperm that make it into the cervix have any chance of making it out alive. So you can go home and watch the rest on, on uh, YouTube. Um, but now staying in the same mood, um, BBC has also made a game called The Great Sperm Race. And um, you can find this online as well and you can play it. So I, I made a video of myself. Well, I'm not a very good video game player, so I'm sure that a, a you know better gamer could do, make their sperm last much longer than mine. Did. <laughs> but, uh, but I think you'll get the idea. And and uh, excuse me, but uh, one of your thunders is on the bottom margin of the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, this is an issue I'm not taking up of who's paid for this and who's interested in all of that. I, I can't, I'm not the point where I can even speak on that. But anyway, this is a little clip of the great story. Um, change in the way this is all depicted. But I, I don't know if you noticed that in the game, 
they were, this room were all different colors, pink, blue, green, orange, brown, um, yellow. And so I, of course, have no idea at this point what they had in mind, except that pink and blue must be male and female, I guess. I don't know whether what the colors are meant to um, indicate, but at least they're not all one color. The other interesting thing, I think, is the reference to the egg as the Holy Grail. I, I don't know if this, uh, um, my, what do you think? Is this Monty Python? I, I don't know. I don't quite know what that is, but it's, I think, an empowered, a very powerful uh, thing to bring into this picture and could possibly really change the kind of grammar of the story. Because um, the Ho Holy Grail, at first approximation, is a cup, as you know, it's a cup, a plate, a vessel, uh, thought to be the unattainable source of happiness, life, sustenance, and infinite abundance. As far as I can see, um, looking uh, in a rather cursory way, it isn't gender. It isn't a male grail or a female grail. It's just the grail of all good things. Uh, it's the goal of characters as far back as Celtic myth, Arthurian legend, Jungian analysis, many science fiction stories, and more. So overall, we have in the 1990s, the egg was indubitably male, but, uh, female. The sperm were always male. <laughs> So one, one thing that's happened is that eggs have achieved uh, more worth, more value. They've become more active. They are more productive. And this could be, and I'm sure there are people in this audience that understand this much better than me, but that they have become literally commodities. They are things that can be exchanged in a market. And the labor producing them has been, get, has been granted what Marx called abstract value. The labor to make them has been, and this is in the newspaper even, in the New York Times a few days ago, the labor to make an egg has been abstracted into a homogenous, massive abstract labor, and this labor has been assigned, quite literally, a socially necessary labor time. In the New York Times article, it, uh, there's a lawsuit brought by egg donors who want more money for their donated eggs, and they're arguing that the existing policy, which is based on taking the labor time it takes a man to produce sperm and comparing it <clears throat> to the labor time it takes a woman to produce an egg, and then you take the amount of money a man gets for, produce, for donating sperm and you multiply it by the greater time it takes a woman. So it's right out of Marx. It's just a complete uh, sort of exercise in showing what socially necessary labor time means. And the women who are um, filing the lawsuit argue that that is not a, a broad enough definition of labor. It's time is not sufficient. Instead, you need to also take account of risk uh, and pain and discomfort um, that the hormonal um, treatment makes necessary for women who want to donate um, eggs. At any rate, um, these, this, this object, this egg, is given a value with a, a, a value on the market with exchange value, in which diverse commodities can be placed on the same scale. Uh, this process probably dovetails in complicated ways with what is happening to stem cells, to uses of cross-sex hormone treatments to make bodies, human bodies, less, less fixed into women who produce egg and men who produce sperm, or organ transplants, including uterus transplantation. So um, in a way, just as the story uh, portrayed in these popular and, and medical accounts is shifting, its, its legs are changing, or its, move, its body, is, it's the body of the story is moving, um, probably in relationship with these very dramatic changes that are taking place in the technology of reproduction, and of sexual and gender identity uh, all, all around um, these, uh, these scientific arenas. And uh, as I, I go further with this, if I do go further with this, I'll be drawing on the very um, relevant, pertinent work by my colleagues um, who work directly in these areas, such as Nancy Shepard Hughes, Leslie Sharp, Carrie Cruz, <coughs> Marilyn Strathern, Catherine Walby, Sarah Franklin, Beck Jordan Young, Sahar Sajahi, or Scott Gilbert, to name but a few. So all these thoughts together make me ponder, as I said I would be pondering at the beginning, whether there's a different stereotype that's emerging, or maybe it was there all along and I couldn't see it, or maybe there's two operating side by side, but it made me think about Melanie Klein, another British 
uh, the incredibly important British psychoanalytic thinker who talked um, in, in very um, anthropologically relevant ways about the mother-father or parent in the development of a, a child. The mother-father or parent is like an unattainable prize who, as long as one has him or her, one has everything one needs, like the Holy Grail. The union involved, if there is a union here, would be the child and the parent in a union of wholeness. The drama of the perilous journey of the pink, yellow, brown, and blue sperm to the Holy Grail and beyond would be the journey of emerging as a new human being from a mother-father figure. And the danger on all sides, and if there's one thing that carries through all these accounts, it's the extreme danger and peril of this process. Um, the sticky vagina that kills, the acid in the female tract, the wrong turn, the going up the wrong ladder, the lethal female immune system, the impenetrable membrane. Could this be, is this alluding to the dangers of the journey to individuation? And here I found it useful to think with Melanie Klein and her insights into the necessity of forming object relations with parental figures. Seeing them as objects, <coughs> not objects in the material sense, but part figures, who are part of us but no longer encompass us. So the sperm seek the holy grail but go on to form a separate individual. We could even draw on the work of Julius Christiva and Elizabeth Gross in the way they untangle the problem of the subject's identity. Take the paradigmatic object to be the orb of the mother father, the holy grail, the egg. The paradigmatic subject would be the individuated being the sperm becomes after it immerses itself in the egg and then forms a separate new human being. So the father, mother, or here the egg, the holy grail, provides the promise of the subject's future stability. That's a quote from Gross. The two, object and subject, egg and sperm, cannot be identical, but are necessarily dependent on each other. At the on the border of the subject's civility are still threatening elements, the repressed, the antisocial, the unclean, the improper, in short, what Christina calls the abject. This excessive residue of subject formation is, in uh, those terms again, an abyss at the very borders of the subject's identity, a hole into which the subject may fall. And in Christina's um, thought-provoking uh, words, <coughs> there looms within abjection, which is the thing one, that has, one has to fear as, object, as uh, individuation takes place, the thing that is not self. There looms within abjection one of those violent, dark revolts of being directed against a threat that seems to emanate from an exorbitant outsider inside, ejected beyond the scope of the possible, the tolerable, the thinkable. It lies there quite close, but it cannot be assimilated. Well, this is a, um, a, a, a voyage into things I, I am not sure really can be made to apply appropriately. Um, however, some of you may have anticipated a practical problem with the logic of this, which is the fear involved in the story of the egg and the sperm affects the sperm on the way to the egg. doesn't appear in any story about what happens after the sperm leave the egg in the form of the zygote, which is when there is an Individual. In fact, as soon in most of these texts, as soon as a new human being is formed upon fertilization, we hear almost nothing. Most of these stories, certainly the BBC, um, Great Race, and so on, do not deal with anything beyond the moment of fertilization, uh, or do, do so in a very brief and cursory way. The trip to the uterus, implantation, let alone pregnancy and birth, belong to different chapters, different issues, different stories. And they are apparently less <laughs> dangerous, although I don't know that that's really true. It is the millions of sperm and spermets, we now need to add, who die on the way to the egg, who capture the imagination. There is sacrifice, so one and only one victorious hero can meet the Holy Grail. And I don't know now at this point in this um, talk whether, whether I could even take this further because this is an inconsistency what I have to deal with. But perhaps I might suggest that a specifically Euro-American drama of the lone entrepreneur sailing off into dangerous waters is foreshadowed in the journey of the holy, the journey to the holy egg, or perhaps it is previewed there. And of course, as we know from the great sperm race, thanks to BBC, 
A contemporary, in their words, nightmarish urban environment is present right in the foreground. So uh, you, you're, maybe I your limit for um, crazy ideas, but one more thing before I close. In the 1991 paper, I did not publish all of the imagery I collected and things I could have said about the egg as a femme fatale, a dangerous um, man-eating monster. In particular, the egg is often figured as a spider-like entity. And in the animation, you might have caught that uh, there are spider-like tendrils that are sent out to bring the chromosomes together. But some of the materials that I was thinking about at the time involved uh, a kind of collision between female nest and spider nest from low culture, like the logo of Charlie's Angels. Did you ever realize that's a spider? Um, to high culture, Louise Bourgeois's Maman. And so at the time in 1991, I wondered whether another kind of story that was going on in the telling of the agonist and, and the fear and anxiety involved in, in the saga uh, was fear by men of women, fear of women, her devouring the vagina, her emasculating powers. But then, looking um, more recently at things that have been written about Louise Bourgeois in the tape catalog for Mama, that was in the tape, not in um, um, Bill Ballard's, this one is, uh, the curator says, quote, encountering Mama, always from the perspective of the child looking up from below, the viewer may experience the sculpture as an expression of anxiety about a mother who is universal, powerful, and terrifying, beautiful, and without eyes to look or a head to think, curious, <coughs> indifferent. So now my, my final thought I will leave you with is a wondering whether the fear in this story is based much more broadly than the male-female sort of mythological fear around a deep-seated recognition of the impossibility of achieving a, a stable identity, especially perhaps under neoliberal conditions, the necessity to engage with fearful edges of the non-self, the mirage of salvation through the mother, father, holy grail, and the inescapability of the fragility of life inside the uterus or out. Oops. And, and that's the end. <laughs>